So this is what we have to consider when we answer the question, should you let your kids watch Disney? Well, it, it's not just Disney. It's, it's everything out there. What is being presented as the norm? And in general, we would want to say uh, early ages protect, older ages engage with them Aaron, I want to ask you a few questions. Are you ready? I'm not sure. Uh, here's my first question. Uh, Aaron, have you ever personally watched a Disney film, a film that was produced <laughs> by the Disney company? Yes. Okay. Have you ever allowed your children to <laughs> view anything produced by Disney? Yes. Okay. Have you ever... Uh, purchased a Disney product? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay. Have you ever been to uh, a Disneyland themed park? Yes. Have you ever taken your kids there? <laughs> yes. Have you ever owned annual passes yes. to Disneyland? Okay. And you my notice. final question is, <laughs> why do you love Satan? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Aaron, you're taking this a little too seriously. <laughs> That was my opening humorous introduction oh. to today's topic. Oh, got it. Which we want to answer the question, <laughs> should you let your kids watch Disney? And Our answer is yes. Well, and if you do, <laughs> why do you worship Satan? There's a second part of that question there. No, okay, Disney has been making the news recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if you follow the news at all, uh, and you suffer from the anxiety that the rest of us do as we follow the news, uh, no, if you follow the news about what has happened recently in the state of Florida, where you have a bill passed by um, the uh, legislature there and uh, supported by the uh, Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, uh, it was on really not uh, kind of banning from the teaching of K through third grade uh, things on gender and sexuality, which seems like a pretty common sense kind of bill. But anyway, uh, we're, that's not... You're the, showing your hand. Oh, well, I'm happy to show my hand because I think it's <laughs> it's pretty common sense. <laughs> uh, public schools should not be teaching K through third on gender and sexuality. Okay, so um, you had that issue and then Disney got into that whole fray. They, because they have Disneyland, Disney World and all their parks in Florida. In Florida, yeah. So they've got a vested interest there. What's going on in Florida? And they came out and, of course, in opposition of the bill. And so then you had, uh, right after that, a, a call, a Zoom call that was leaked. I don't know if you guys saw this, but it was Disney executives kind of on this internal Zoom call and some of that video was leaked and you can watch some of it and what these different executives are saying. So we want to show you a clip of just a number of those different executives and what they're saying about Disney, the, the whole Disney family of products and theme parks and films. Right, and it's not family, it's an empire, okay? <laughs> the Disney empire and what, what they want to do and how they're changing things really to be LGBTQ, I wouldn't say friendly, but to be uh, prom actively, actively promoting those things, LGBTQ activists, mm -hmm. okay? So watch this video clip. Last summer, we, we removed all of the um, gendered greetings in relationship to our life skills. So we no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we, we've trained, we, we've provided training for all of our, our cast members in, in relationship to that. So now they know it's, it's hello everyone or hello friends. We, we are in the process of changing over those, those recorded messages. And so many of you are probably familiar when we brought the fireworks back to the Magic Kingdom. We no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we say dreamers of all ages. I'm, I'm here as a mother of, of two queer children, actually, um, uh, one transgender child, um, um, and one pansexual child, um, and and also as a leader, many 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 LGBTQIA characters in our stories, and 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 yet we don't have enough leads um, and narratives in which gay characters just 
just get to be characters. On my little pocket of like, you know, proud family, Disney TVA, um, the showrunners were super welcoming, Meredith Roberts and like the, the our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. And so like, I, I feel like I felt like it was, I mean, like maybe it was that way in the past, but I guess like something must have happened in the last like, like they are turning it around. They're going hard. Let's have these two characters kiss. Let's in the background. This like I was just wherever I could, just basically adding queerness to like. The, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But like, I, I just was like, no one would stop me, and no one was trying to stop me. We're also reacting from the reality that when they can erase you, when they can criminalize your existence, when they can demonize who you are, the next step is to criminalize you and take your kids. And we're already seeing that in Texas. So the slippery slope between these ugly messages, um, you know, emanating from legislative leaders in our state and then amplified by our governor, whose spokesperson immediately began calling everyone who opposed this bill uh, groomers, a.k.a. pedophiles. Yeah, um, I've had the privilege of working with the Moon Girl team for the last two years, and they've been really open to exploring queer stories. And so I put together like a tracker of our background characters to make sure that we have like a, the full breadth of expression. And uh, we got into a very similar conversation, Carrie, of like, oh, all of our like gender nonconforming characters are in the background. Okay, so there you have Disney executives telling us what their agenda is, what their um, what their action plan is, and what they're going to do. Uh, okay, so I think part of the question we want to answer is what's a what's a Christian parent's response to this? Now on Twitter, if you are on Twitter, um, which again will increase your anxiety and your levels of depression, uh, <laughs> we don't advise it. <laughs> but we, there, you know, different Christians that we follow, and just trying to keep a pulse on culture and Christians' response to culture. We have a prominent Christian, quote unquote, celebrity who's a, an artist, an author, uh, has a platform. I don't mean celebrity in kind of a derogatory sense, mm -hmm. but just a just a descriptive sense, like mm -hmm. this person has a large platform. Her name is Jackie Hill Perry. And uh, I don't know, a month or so ago, she tweeted out about this new Disney movie entitled Turning Red. And it was a Disney Pixar movie. And maybe uh, I'm guessing most of you are aware of this one. And uh, she tweeted out a picture of the, the, the movie poster and then said, one side of Christian parent Twitter is like, what a wonderful film. We had a great discussion with our kids after. The other side is like, quote, watch it and your kids will become Satan worshipers, end quote. So here's a tweet that describes two different responses from Christian parents to uh, a, a movie from Disney Pixar. And, you know, one is, hey, we watched it with our kids. Wonderful film. Had a great discussion, which that sounds good and engaging and you know and then the other side is if you know the other response from parents is watch it and your kids will become satan worshipers so obviously there are implications there if you're with that first group you're kind of you know that's the appropriate response just let your kids watch and engage with it and have a good discussion if you have any sense of protecting your kids from it like right don't let them watch it uh um the you you do that out of you know just this overprotection, there's a ridiculous kind of protection, and and that is that's kind of that's looked down upon. In fact, that's what you that you so what you see in the responses to this tweet. Just watch all the tweets, and it's like oh these you know these dumb Christian conservatives. What you know what what are they doing? What are they thinking? This is this is ridiculous kind of responses. And so yeah, um, I think underlying that one is more like out of fear. The fear that your kids would become Satan worshipers, you know, don't, you wouldn't have them, want, you would protect them because you don't want them to worship Satan. Now, it's it, an irrational fear. Right. That's what's implied. Yeah. And, and I assume she's, you know, exaggerating in this example, um, you know, of giving the two sides, although it does seem like the first example, uh, there's not really a lot. There's not exaggeration. There's not, there. no exaggeration. It's just, we we had a good discussion. We yeah. watched it. We enjoyed it. We had a good discussion. That sounds like a reasonable one. And then this one, yeah, sounds, 
I'm sure she's exaggerating. You exaggerate, um, but, but you exaggerate the conservative position too. So you would call this the conservative. You think this is what she's saying is the conservative position on the movie? Yeah, I think. Well, it, it, that's that. It, it seems to be implied there. Um, and and then conservative meaning like conservative people think political. But are you meaning? No, I'm just saying a conservative Christian, not okay. not even politically. Like, like just a conservative Christian, kind of your, you know, your typical conservative evangelical, however, okay. uh, you know, who holds to orthodoxy mm -hmm. and whatever. Uh, those Christians are, I think, in this one, most of them would be. Well, and, and she doesn't say this explicitly, so we're not. Right. But it's interesting. I, I think what I was referencing are the responses. People, what they definitely read from this oh, yeah. is that it's the conservatives. It's not going to be the progressives mm. who take this approach. So, and I think if you if you probed a little bit, hey, you know, Jackie, were, were there any conservatives who uh, are pro progressives that you had in mind with watch it and you will become like sa Satan worshipers? I think if she's going to be honest, she's going to say, no, that's not, you know, that's not their response. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify, you're not talking conservative and liberal, like politically, you mean conservative, progressive, like on social in issues and faith. Okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Okay. So, but it, what it ends up doing, you know, whether she intended this or not, what it ends up doing is kind of demonizing. Demonizes the parents who would protect their kids from a film like this. Yeah. Yeah, because watch it and your kids will become Satan worshipers. Like that's that's the hyperbole. Exaggerate that mm -hmm. to make that position and everything associated with mm -hmm. it look kind of dumb. Yeah. You know, and this is this is the, you know, level of discourse in our culture or it, well, it, it's it, it certainly is a limited medium. Twitter's a limited medium, you know, but this is kind of Representative discourse, right? Um, you you don't agree with a particular side, and it's it's easy to kind of demonize them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I, I mean, number one, I want to say, look, this this does demonize those who might find appropriate protection. Um, and I don't know if demonize is, is the right word. Maybe that's too strong of a word. It, it certainly, oh, look up a, what's a, in a, a thesaurus. What's a less stronger <laughs> word than demonize? Uh, disparage. It disparages mm -hmm. them. Okay. Yeah. Demonize is probably not the right word. It disparages them. And, and then, you know, I think the impact on the culture, when you hear kind of messages like this, oh, conservative Christians, they, they go to these, these extremes and they do this and they protect their kids because they're worried about Satan around every corner or whatever. Then mm -hmm. you just, you, you, of course, that, that has an impact. Yeah. Cause you don't want to be like that. Yeah. Cause and, it's silly. Yeah, 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 of course, to think that your kids are going to watch this movie and become Satan worshipers. Or, of course, that's, again, it's hyperbole, yeah. but to think it that... It nudges you that that way. Yeah, and we want to say, so number one, this is not a fair kind of tweet. It's not a fair assessment of Christian um, parents who do want to protect their kids from something like a movie, uh, Turning Red, that Disney produced. And then, uh, secondly, that's not the only... These aren't the only two options. <laughs> well, we want to offer a third option here that is maybe, uh, well, hopefully is thoughtful and biblical that will help parents navigate this question, should you let your kids watch Disney, okay? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, we already, Aaron has admitted <laughs> on this podcast to Sin. her and her children <laughs> uh, consuming <laughs> Disney products. I love how you separate yourself i only do that for me and the children i only do that when it's convenient okay <laughs> only when it's convenient i've noticed and that only when you. it makes me look good okay let's just be clear i really noticed that about you no we i mean we live in southern california we are 10 minutes from disneyland we have um well i've lived here pretty much my whole life you've li lived here a big part of your life we've had disneyland passes you know year-round passes several times um, obviously we've, you know, you, so not only going to Disneyland, but then of course, I mean, 
most Americans, Disney is a part of their kids growing up either mm -hmm. through movies or through toys, through dress up clothes, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we live so close to Disneyland that Mickey comes and visits our neighborhood <laughs> twice. No, a, a he month. doesn't. But we can hear the fireworks every night. Um, from our house. Yeah. So that's that's how close we are. So Which so what are you saying? Live in Rome, it. live as the Romans? <laughs> no. Live in Anaheim, live as the Disneylandites. No, it's obviously know. easier for us to have Disneyland and Disney as a part of our lives because it's 10 minutes away. Then if you live in Nebraska, like friends of ours, you, you have to make a lot more effort for the park experience yeah. is all I'm saying. But I don't of think course, they even sell Disneyland products in Nebraska. <laughs> I think that's so far out there that, no, I'm just kidding. Sounding <laughs> anyone, I, anyone living in Nebraska, I love <laughs> Nebraskans, just so you know that. We have a Nebraskan on staff. So, um, okay, so Disney, obviously, as a company, is is has all different kinds of parts to it, the park experience, the movies, the products, all of this sort of thing. And then, of course, Disney as a company has changed. And, of course, it started with Walt <laughs> Disney, and he started the whole thing, really, for his daughters. He There's the story of him sitting in Griffith Park in Los Angeles on a park bench and looking around at the park and saying, I would love to take my daughters, my two daughters, to somewhere where it's safe and clean and they can go on rides, go on a merry-go-round. And anyway, this is how he started thinking of Disneyland. And um, of course, he was an artist. And okay, so there's the whole story. Now, Disney has changed. And so even thinking through the, you know, as we've been parents 27 years, so even in the 27 years, we've seen a shift in the Disney company. And the clip that we showed, um, I think, demonstrates the open, the openness of their shift. Now, that was a leaked Zoom call. They weren't actually, they don't do commercials like what yeah. we just played the clip of, but they, they are open about where they're heading. Yeah. And, and well, kind of they have, what their values are now. I mean, Disneyland here has, I, I think it's twice a year they do a Pride Day, right? And so that's obviously, and in, 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 um, they're actively mm -hmm. promoting um, gay and lesbian lifestyle. And uh, of course, yeah, I mean, this is, it's not a secret that this is the trajectory right. Disney, Disneyland has been on. So the question one question we wanted to tackle, because this now is the conversation with parents since the Florida thing that happened and since movies like Turning Red and there's other things too. Obvi their TV shows, there's been a lot of changes in their TV shows. Well, even on the Disney Plus platform, mm -hmm. there's a little Pixar, I think it's a Pixar uh, mini film called Out mm -hmm. that is just, I don't know, it's like six or seven minutes and uh i actually watched it with the kids to evaluate it and uh it's about a a, a boy uh, coming out to his uh family his his mom and dad as gay mm -hmm. you know and so this is and when you watch it it's clearly a piece uh actively mm -hmm. promoting it so the question then is well you just admitted watching it and having a discussion with our kids. Mm -hmm. So you're in that first category of that tweet that she <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so but, I'm okay, you know, I'm okay disparaging well, the other side so because one, you're not on my side. <laughs> so no. one distinction we will make later well, is talking about ages and, yes. and how as parents, you know, how, you know, like that tweet, those two responses, yeah. how we think, well, there might be an appropriate time to ha do both respond yes. or, you know, well, to there respond is, in, in those ways. Yeah, we want to offer more nuanced mm -hmm. response. Yeah. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and announce officially here that we at Maven are launching uh, an official boycott of Disney <laughs> no, right not. now. We're Oh, we're not? No, I we're thought this not. was the camp campaign you wanted. <laughs> we're going to no. boycott Disney. No. Okay. No, so this is, but this boycott, discussion is what is happening right now. We have had friends that are asking us, what are you guys going to do? And and so 
what do we do as Christian parents who obviously we, you know, Disney is a part of American culture, a big part of American culture. How do we respond to what's happening at Disney? And do we boycott a company that is openly encouraging, supporting, and holding up as a model lifestyles that are contrary to the Christian worldview. Yeah. Well, and this is where um, I, we want to to think clearly. And part of thinking clearly is making careful distinctions. So we want to distinguish here uh, between kind of refusing as an individual or as a family, refusing uh, to participate in some kind of economic uh, you know, transaction where you are you know, paying your money for products or services from a certain company. Uh, and, and then distinguishing that from a full-on boycott, okay? Uh, I think when you look at kind of the free market economy of the U.S., which I know is not a pure free market, and that, that's a whole nother discussion. We need to actually do one on economics for parents and and get, you know, think think Christianly about, about, that, about that issue. But just in general, as a free market, generally speaking, uh, when a business acts in ways that you find to be immoral or unsatisfactory or the service is not up to par or maybe there's been some health outbreak you know uh there's some uh with salmonella you know in the burger or whatever then avoiding uh kind of financial transactions with those businesses or those companies is completely legitimate but that's different than a boycott when we talk about a boycott so <clears throat> i guess you could say well, no, here, uh, here's what we want to make the distinction between a boycott, which a boycott would be uh, withdrawing from kind of your business, withdrawing your business for the, punish, uh, for the purpose of punishing that business so that you coerce them to do something, all right? And that seems to be different in its intent and its scope, because there then it's going to be a public campaign that you need to open up to lots of people and you got to get a lot of people on board to do that. Okay, so we're not we're not talking about boycotting Disney. We're talking about as individuals or as families, what is our response to Disney on something like mm -hmm. this? Okay, so we're not talking about a boycott. And it's just important to make that distinction. And boy, I mean, that's that's something that Christians, I think, need to think about. What is what really is a boycott? Uh, what's the nature of a boycott? And uh, is it is it number one? Of course, is it biblical to do that kind of thing? Do we see this modeled for us in Scripture? You know, someone disagrees with us, or they're promoting an immoral lifestyle. Then do we withdraw from any kind of business interactions with them? Uh, and then number two, are, are those things effective? I mean, if they are biblically warranted, then are they effective? Mm -hmm. And of course, I think in general, I mean, some people, I, I think some Christians, they, they kind of look down on the whole idea of boycott because a lot of times it's maybe Christ, they hear Christians calling for boycotts, mm -hmm. which number one, it's not just Christians who call for boycotts. We yeah. see this all the time. And it's kind of a tool of, cancel culture right now to kind of, and it actually goes, well, yeah, boycott would probably be the charitable term for it. Cancel culture is even beyond a boycott. And so everyone on every side of every issue, you know, there, there, there's examples of boycott. So that's not just something that Christians call for. But then number two, I think we would say, if someone has a, a problem with Christians doing it, the question is, do you always think boycotts are wrong because it seems like we have some examples that we could point to where a boycott was maybe justified and effective yeah and well i'm thinking about the start of this country and the boston tea party which kicked off a tea boycott from england and the you know the the american colonies were frustrated by 
uh, King George and the taxes. And, um, and so they, they got together and boycott, we're, we're going to boycott tea from England and not buy it. Mm -hmm. Of course, that there's lots of boycotts through American history that have been very effective. I, I think about uh, Rosa Parks and mm -hmm. the bus boycott and um, that, of course, was orchestrated by the NAACP and Martin Luther King and, you know, all these boycotts that were that were happening that got people's attention yeah. that really, you know, for the bus boycott really got their attention because now they're losing money. Yeah. <laughs> and and so it was pushing them to change their policies, to change their unjust laws and rules, uh, the Tea Party and or the Tea Party, the the tea boycott and the bus boycott, same intention there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. we could think of so many examples, but those just immediately popped in my mind. Yeah, so be careful if you want to just rule out all boycotts because you hear Christians talking about mm -hmm. this and you th you're just tired of it and you're, you're you know, it, it, do you have kind of a principled argument against all boycotts? Because if that's the case, then yeah, things like the bu uh, Montgomery bus boycott mm -hmm. with Rosa Parks, the Tea Party, you know, all these other things, you're going to have to also condemn as well. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you do think that boycotts are legitimate at, at times, like so, for instance, you know, in the civil rights area, to stand up to injustice, to make a clear statement, to punish. Mm -hmm. because there's this clear injustice, not just that these people disagree with me, but there's a clear injustice, right? Maybe, and then that's the time to reserve kind of the force of a boycott. Uh, but then thinking, gosh, how often do we do this? Like, you can't just boycott everything. It just loses effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to boycott everyone you disagree with, well, man, good luck with that, right? <laughs> Even on important issues, because there are, there's an endless amount of businesses that, uh, and you would have to do some impossible research to figure out every company that ha holds some moral stance you disagree with, and you're going to boycott their, uh, you know, their products. Well, that that is um, that's going to be, uh, I think, totally impractical. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, there's the biblical issue. I don't think it's warn i you know i don't think we're we're pushed that way with by by the teaching of scripture but then it just it's i don't you're not gonna be able to do it mm -hmm. <laughs> so As, there's an endless parade of yeah. problems out there with and you companies. mean to organize a boycott where you're rallying people not just because again to make the distinct distinction between your family can decide hey we're not going to do business with this company Yes. Because we found out this company gives money to the abortion industry. So yeah. we're we're not going to do business there in that we can decide those kinds of things all the time. That's right. That's which, why we're making this distinction yeah. because boycott is kind of this public crusade mm -hmm. to kind of punish a company and then coerce it to head the direction you want it to head. Okay. And that's so we're saying that's different than as an individual family who says, you know what? For the time being, we are no longer going to purchase Disney products or watch Disney movies, okay? So we, that's the distinction we want to make here. And so we're not talking about public boycotts right now. We're just talking about you, your family. What are you going to do? Should you let your kids watch Disney? Okay, so that's the question we want to answer, but wanted to wanted to clarify there. Okay, so uh, what we've talked about on this podcast is an approach to parenting that says, hey, there's a short-term goal. And there's a long-term goal. And those two things go together. The short-term goal with your kids when they're younger, there's a short-term goal of protection. There's an appropriate amount of protection that you offer your kids to protect them from the world. And that is good and healthy. And it doesn't mean you're like sheltering your kids in some kind of negative way. Although, I mean, sh shelter has this negative connotation. But to offer shelter is actually a good thing, right? <laughs> shelter from the storm, that's good when the kids are younger. But that's not the only goal, and that's a short-term goal. The long-term goal is that we send out our kids equipped and prepared into the culture. So in that short-term goal, you're also working on the long-term goal. 
And so those two things together provide us, I think, kind of a good strategy for our kids while they're in our homes. And of course, uh, we've mentioned this before. It's in the book that I wrote with John Stone Street, A A Practical Guide to Culture. We open the book in the introduction with this kind of analogy. And we talk about it kind of in the, uh, the surfing analogy, right? I don't, when I try to teach my kids how to surf, I don't just push them out there and say, go for it. Like, I want you to surf, go. Uh, no, there's first protection and I have to train and equip them to be ready for the ocean because there's danger there. And, uh, in the same way, we don't just push our kids out into the culture and say, Hey, go ahead, be salt and light. Uh, No, there's danger there. And so we have to prepare them. And that preparation needs to be done in the context of protection. So there's short-term goal, long-term goal. And if you think about it, this analogy holds for really any example where there is some some danger involved. Mm -hmm. And so let's realize as parents, there's danger involved with sending your kids out into the world. Okay. Now, what we're we're not talking about protection from like life in general. Like there's ordinary life that happens. We're not saying protect them from difficulty, protect them from, you know, struggle and those kinds of things. No, primarily what we're talking about here is protection from false ideas. That's the protection. And so uh, you know, I mean, scripture lays on parents the duty to protect and to train them up. And, uh, you know, we have passages like Proverbs 22, 6, you know, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, the, the idea of training up. Um, uh, Matthew 18, 6, Jesus' kind of view of children, when he says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea, right? And so there's a concern for uh, little ones and causing them to, to sin. And I think well, the implication, what's entailed there is that we, we need to protect, you know, there's an appropriate protection for children. Um, you know, and so... Uh, so short-term protection, long-term, send them into the culture. Which that's helpful to think through, even going back to the tweet that we talked about where it talked about the two different Christian responses. And so one was, watch the film, have a good discussion, uh, and this film particularly turning red, which that... And then the other one was basically shield them from it. So those two responses could be different depending on the age of the kids of the Christian parents that you're hearing from. So our kids are 10 and up. So you said you watched the uh, Pixar short clip, the out out. Yeah. And you watched that with our kids and so we watched that. I'm pretty sure you had our 10 year old in that. Yeah, Jonah, well. Jonah watched it with Ella and I. So, so that, you know, at that age and with that kid, you, we felt like, oh, that's fine, you know, yeah. that we could watch it, that he wouldn't be taken in by it, and, and, and that it would have, we would have a fruitful conversation. And we've, we've done this a bunch mm-hmm. with things. Um, but, If Jonah was four or five and you're talking about a full length film or a TV show called out where every week, you know, this is what's being presented as good and normal. Yeah. Or even the short, even the short film. Yeah. So, so there's, we wouldn't let him watch it. Right. So there's difference in, in the ages of our kids and, and what it's hard, you know, little ones don't have discernment. Of course, a 10-year-old doesn't have a ton of discernment, which is why we watch it with them and and then we talk to them yeah, we about talk it. it through. Um, so talk so th- just thinking about our goal with our kids and thinking about, of course, our our goal when they're 16 is different, you know, our or what we're doing with them at 16 is different than what we're doing with them at six. And what we're protecting them from and what we're allowing them to watch and what we're allowing them to go do on their own. I mean, there's so many differences 
in those ages. So thinking about that, I think is, is helpful. And of course, when they are younger, we are protecting them more because they don't have discernment and media, especially movies and TV shows and things like that, even songs, but all of that can have such an influence and an impression. It can leave such an impression on them as they're figuring out the world at this young age yeah. that we may want to protect them from a harmful idea because they might not see it as harmful. They, they, they wouldn't know it's harmful and they could, they, that could affect their thinking. Those ideas could have an effect on them. Yeah. And that, and that's where, you know, we've talked about how culture powerfully shape, how it most powerfully shapes us is by presenting to us what is normal. Mm -hmm. And so if now in children's shows, uh, the LGBTQ lifestyles are being presented as normal, well, this is how culture most powerfully shapes us. It's just presented as normal uh, through entertainment and media and then through all other spheres mm -hmm. of the culture. And when you're surrounded by all these spheres saying, hey, this is normal, this is good, this is the path to healthy uh, life and happy life, and well, then that's gonna have an impact. So that is why we want to be protecting at those younger stages. So what they are getting as the norm are not things that are, are mm -hmm. sinful and harmful in their lives. Yeah. Okay, so there's appropriate protection there. Yeah, I think that, that thinking about what's presented as normal, what are kids thinking is normal, is that's really the key in it because it's not like Disney is coming out and saying, we're trying to get children to worship Satan. You know, this is <laughs> what, what we want. It's, I mean, they say it in, in the Zoom call that they want to have more and more characters so that mm. it becomes more and more just normal. Yeah. So that's how they want to shape the audience. Think about that one executive who talked about uh, her not so quiet agenda, but then she she mentioned just briefly, like, you know, having these two characters kiss and having this in the background, mm -hmm. right? And so even if it's not Everywhere the main she could character, fit it in. yeah, yeah. Every so what? Why would you do that? To normalize, to normalize it, it. Yeah. to present it as the norm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is what we have to consider when we answer the question: Should you let your kids watch Disney? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's not just Disney; it's <laughs> it's everything yeah. out there. What is being presented as the norm? And in general, we would want to say: uh, Early ages protect; older ages engage with them and that content. It might be a good just way to divide this into two halves here. Mm -hmm. And um, and we have some practical steps, some really practical steps on this. You know, I, I think number one, we've got to develop a healthy skepticism on uh, what is out there in different media, right? And particularly we're talking about film and TV media. Uh, you know, whether it's a a streaming platform or whether it's going to the movies or, you know, cable TV, if you still do that kind of thing, um, whatever it is, you know, or YouTube videos, right? Uh, social media videos, that kind of stuff, you and I should have a healthy skepticism about. And here's why. The, the folks who are producing much of this content do not share our worldview. They do not share a Christian worldview. They do not share a biblical view. And so many of them have been deceived and they bought into the lies of the culture. They bought into the lies of this world. And so what they're going to do is they are going to put that stuff into their films. And so we've got to have a healthy skepticism. But, you know, help, I, I use the adjective healthy because it's not, oh, that's from the world. Let's just dump it all. <laughs> Uh, no, because there are things, there are good Disney films out there. Mm -hmm. I, I remember giving a talk on this a number of years ago uh, on just consuming media. And I had <laughs> this mom, and I'm sure well-intentioned, you know, mom believer, who asked me about Disney movies. And uh, and actually the claim was that Walt Disney was a Satanist. So if Walt Disney was a Satanist, or should we watch Disney movies, right? <laughs> 
No, uh, anyway, I, there's no evidence that Walt Disney was a Satanist. <laughs> Even if he were, it doesn't mean a Satanist can't create movies with true messages in it, right? Because you could just simply take certain Disney movies and say, hey, there's a good theme. There's a good message here. Uh, Toy Story could be one of those where the, the larger themes there of loyalty and friendship and courage and sacrifice, those are just main themes in that movie. And those are commended in that movie. And so we would say, yeah, okay, that, that thing is, that particular piece is good. But that doesn't mean that we can endorse everything. And that's why you need a healthy skepticism. Yeah, and healthy skepticism is good to have knowing that we as Christians live in a post-Christian world. And like you're saying, so many of the creators of this kind of medium don't have a Christian worldview. And so then we know the ideas that people have come out in their art. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we just have the lens on that we realize okay, so the ideas are going to come through the art and it may be, it may be that they make a movie that's great and is totally fine for us to watch Toy Story up. I mean, all kind, there's all kinds of Disney Pixar movies that we love, but just that we have a healthy skepticism that, hey, a movie might come out that doesn't share the worldview. And so we have to ha be skeptical, not that we're fearful, but that we're wise, that yeah. we, have, we have wisdom and we have a healthy lens of protection of how our kids would be influenced and that we know there are ideas out there that want to capture our kids and, and those ideas will pull them away from truth, yeah. that they're lies and we should want to protect our kids from lies. That's that's a good thing. Yeah. And so here's our here's our biblical worldview, our Christian worldview that tells us God has made all mankind in his image. So there's a goodness to human beings. There's a nobility to human beings. And Paul tells us in uh you know, in in Romans that all those image bearers are also fallen. Right, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans three twenty three. And now, now, what's the extent of that? It doesn't mean that fallen human beings can't know anything about truth, because Paul also says in Romans two that the Gentiles have God's moral law written on their hearts, and they have access to moral truth. So they're fallen and they're they're deceived, but that doesn't mean that they can't know any truth. And this is why it's a healthy skepticism. It's taking our Christian worldview and applying it and saying, yeah, we've got fallen human beings who are made in God's image. They can make true and good and beautiful stories. Mm -hmm. And they can also promote false worldviews through their storytelling. And so art is this major vehicle in our culture. And so we just need to have a healthy skepticism. And this avoids, you know, this avoids the kind of this di the dichotomy. Mm -hmm. There's an extreme dichotomy. Either you you watch everything and you have good discussion and it's wonderful, or you just, you know, you you pull out of all of culture. And no, what we're saying here is, no, we're engaging culture, mm -hmm. but there's a healthy skepticism based on the Christian worldview. And, and knowing that our culture can't be trusted as much anymore because the, the, the Christian worldview is waning. Mm -hmm. uh, as Natasha Crane says in her new book, uh, we're a worldview minority. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a helpful term to, to put into perspective where we're at right mm -hmm. now in the culture, okay? Yeah, so just another step practically is that as parents, we have to review the things we are putting in front of our kids especially when they're younger, you're just going to have to review everything. Actually, we just heard Wait, about... Hold on. Did you say everything? Everything that we let in front of our kids. Now, so here's... I agree. I just wanted to emphasize that <laughs> um, because I think we're at a stage where, yeah, yeah, everything has to be evaluated. So if that sounds like a lot of work, here's some quick tips that don't require a lot of work. You can show your kids, let them watch older things that you've already watched and you know are good. What would be an example of that? Like, well, we've, we're, we've been talking about Disney. So 
you could let them watch some of the older Disney mm-hmm. stuff that you know is good. We've all watched Toy Story. You know it's good. You can let them watch it. Um, the Incredibles, uh, you know, the old Snow White or Sleeping Beauty. You can let them watch older things that you already know. And maybe you don't like those, so you don't show them those. But yeah. things that you already know are good, have them watch those things. And and so if you feel like, oh, my gosh, that's so overwhelming because there's new stuff coming out every day, you're right. You don't have to let them watch all the new stuff. And actually what this might force you to do is realize, oh, this is actually too much to <laughs> have to figure out. So maybe it will cut down on screens and then right. maybe you need to have your kids play outside a lot more mm-hmm. and read a lot more books. And um, and I would say same thing with books, read old books that are trusted and are good. But do so, audi- do audible books. Yeah, I mean, you know, oh, there's so many other things to do besides watch something. But I I realize this is 2022, and this is this what's is what, been presented this is as normal. Has been presented to normal. Be so in, most of us parents think that our kids in elementary school are supposed to have their own iPad and watch their own stuff. But you cannot assume when you give the iPad if they're watching Nickelodeon that everything they're going to watch is good. If they're watching Disney, that everything is going to be good. So, so frankly, we just, as parents in this culture, in this time, you have got to review and know what you are putting in front of your kids. So we actually just heard about on the net, on Netflix, the show Go Dog Go, Mm -hmm. which is marketed to young, young kids and, on that show, there was a Christmas episode, and this mom we heard from this mom who thought this was a safe show, and then she was putting her daughter to bed, and her daughter said something about how people can have two mommies, and it, her daughter was like four, and she said, um, "Why would why do you think someone can have two mommies?" And she said, "Well, that's what they on Go Dog Go they had two mommies, <laughs> and the mom hadn't even realized that they had stuck in this one episode." Yeah. And so there's there's, an, there's another, another Netflix there's another Netflix show for kids called Ridley Jones. Oh yeah. And there's a there's a bison mm-hmm. uh you know like a, a stuffed animal bison um that is non-binary. Mm. That's that, that I mean that's intentionally put in there, right? And here you go, presented as normal. Mm-hmm. Presented as normal. Yeah. So so you think you can trust these shows? You know, and you just, you can't, you've got to be diligent. And so one thing to help parents who feel overwhelmed is, hey, don't watch as much, don't watch as many shows that, yeah. you know, you've got to think of other alternatives, play outside more, listen to audible books, mm-hmm. um, those yeah, kinds of things. And I think limiting that stuff will end up reaping many rewards for yeah. your family. And there, there, are, there is so much good art out there that you can you can have family movie nights you can you of course can have your kids watch shows every once in a while but maybe this shift will help some of us think about how much time we're letting our kids watch and if if, if you're letting your kids watch TV 3 4 hours a day and you're thinking there's no way I can review everything well then that might tell you that you need to pull back on how much they're watching. Yeah. Uh, wow, you're getting radical, Aaron. <laughs> you're making parents out there uncomfortable. Um, now, and here's a, here's another tool too. There are Christians out there who are doing some of that evaluate, evaluative work for us. Uh, so we use for movies mm-hmm. uh, pluggedin.com, and they will review uh, you know upcoming movies and new movies. That, and they'll they'll give a kind of a breakdown of all the elements so that you can kind of look at that without having to watch the two hour movie for yourself. You can read through that. So we'd encourage Which, people to use plugged in. Yeah. And plugged in was especially helpful once our kids got older, junior high, high school. Now they're getting invited to go to movies or going to a friend's birthday party and they're going to watch a movie or whatever. And we can't review it mm-hmm. before they watch. Yeah. And so. That's where plugged in um, really has been a great tool for us. Yeah, and I you know co- some parents will point to Common Sense Media, which is uh, there's some good stuff there too. But they're LGBTQ affirming, mm-hmm. so even you know th- in that group that's reviewing stuff 
for kids, you're, you're not there's you're you're not sharing the same worldview. Mm-hmm. And so this is why kind of our third practical step is you got to teach worldview. You got to teach worldview to your kids, uh, and you 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 start from the very youngest of ages by teaching them good biblical truth and teaching them that biblical truth is a reflection of reality. This is an explanation. What we read in the scriptures is an explanation of the real world. And you focus on, you know, some of those big questions. Where do we come from? Like with our younger kids, really uh, helping them to understand that God is our creator. He is the origin of all things. And then not only that, but then who is God and looking at his character and his attributes and really getting to, to, to you know, uh, going kind of deeper in their knowledge of God so that they have thicker um, ideas about God, not these thin ideas. Mm-hmm. God is out there and he's friendly, basically, and he loves me. You know, we want to go a lot deeper than that and strengthen their convictions about God and who he is, and then tie that into the world that we live in. So for instance, you know, trans stuff, transgender ideology is being presented as normal. Well, a world, a Christian worldview combats that, and it fortifies a young mind against those false ideas because you have a God who has created us. He's created us in his image. He's not only created us, created us in his image, but he's also made us male and female, right? And so as we lay out the Christian worldview, this gives an explanation for why the world is the way it is. And God's plan for it. It's his his design for our functioning and flourishing. So uh, teaching Christian worldview is not optional. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it starts early on by teaching our theology. What do we believe about God, his world, uh, you know, and, and all of that. So which that foundation that we lay then is so valuable then as they get older, and now they're being exposed to different ideas about the world, about people, then they have a good foundation. And then this helps in discussion, which is our last practical point, to have discussion and analysis with your older kids. And older, I mean, you you parents know when your kids are ready for that. That's why we can't say, this is what you do after your kid's eighth birthday. Yeah. You know, because kids are so different. Our five kids have been so different. Even just, I'm thinking about this topic of movies. Our five kids have been so different in how movies affect them. Mm-hmm. And so we can't tell you the age to, to start this because some kids have to, movies really affect them deeply. And so you have to put, things like that off for, for a long time. Yeah. But, um, so you, you decide the age, but as you, as we said before, we, we watched that short thing with our 10 year old, um, and, and discussed it with him. But, but this is what, so what we mean is increasing discussion and analysis by all the things that are happening around you. Uh, we're talking specifically about media, but this would be about all the things that are happening around us. We talked about this in the podcast episode we did on narration, Mm -hmm. but just talking about what's happening and seeing if they can see the ideas that are underneath it. I'm thinking of an example. So uh, this was a number of years ago when Moana came out, um, staying on the Disney theme. And we love Moana. You know, it was... uh, Well, I don't know if we would say we love Moana. Okay, one of our daughters loved Moana and loved the music, loved the beach, like whole theme and all loved of that. Loved the humanistic-centered messages. <laughs> oh, so no. obviously you're bringing up the issue of some of the messages in the movie. Mm-hmm. So we went to the movie, I think we took all the kids, and and anyways, as we right when we were driving home, we started talking about, okay, what were the good things in the movie? Oh, Moana was so cute when she was a baby. Wasn't she so cute? And da, da, oh, I loved I loved the music. The music was really good. Whatever. And then um okay, and then the what was the name of the god? The uh Maui? Maui. So Ma- well, Maui said he was the creator of all things. Like, oh yeah, you notice that. So obviously we don't 
you know, believe that, that that's silly to think that Maui created everything. And anyway, things like that. But one thing in particular that I didn't know if the kids had noticed, and I said to them, hey, did you guys notice that now this is another Disney movie, but also common in a lot of movies that are targeted to you guys, to kids, that for Moana to do the right thing, to do the brave thing, whatever the movie was saying was the right and brave thing, that she had to disobey her parents to do the right thing. Did you guys notice that? And, you know, it was kind of quiet. Oh, yeah. And then we actually started thinking, think about how many movies the main character to do the right thing has to actually disobey their parents. And then in the end, the parents learn, oh, yeah, I guess you were right, kid. It's like kind every Disney princess movie <laughs> you're describing right there. I know. It is. So why do you let your kids watch <laughs> Disney, Erin? So that's an example of when we see things, you know, helping our kids. Now, sometimes they're going to see stuff, and it's it's so cool, especially the more you talk about this. Mm -hmm. And this is why we do it, to help them to have these kind of eyes to see the messages that are coming at them and to be able to recognize them and then evaluate their truth or their lie and to reject it or accept it. Yeah. You know, so th this is what we do. And it's it's all it's in all kinds of ways. Yeah, I think about the process. First, you do it for them, right? When they're younger, you do it for them. You protect them from the false messages out there and, mm -hmm. and movies that have harmful ideas in them. And then you do it with them. And so uh, this is where it would be good to intentionally watch a show at home where you can hit the pause button. Mm -hmm. And you can say, okay, hey, we're only 10 minutes into this, but who's who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? What's the conflict? Where you're getting them to start engaging with it rather than passively, passively absorbing it. And so you're doing it with them and then you're pointing things out like mm -hmm. you know you did with Moana. Uh, and so you do that with them. So ultimately, they can do it on their own. That's the long-term goal. But it takes some intentionality. It takes training your kids. And so you, we do that worldview analysis with them. We foster that discussion at appropriate ages when they can start seeing some of that stuff, when they can start understanding some of that stuff. And so, and what we're trying to do is equip them because we want them to do two things ultimately on their own. And that's that's first to see the false ideas that are out there, right? And so that's why teaching worldview is so important. You aren't going to see the counterfeits, right, without knowing the original. And so uh, they've got to learn how to see these things for themselves and then also to be able to think for themselves. We want them to think through these things for themselves. That's the long-term goal. So there's some protection uh, early on, then there's engagement with it so that we can kind of send them off on their own and to be able to handle this difficult culture that, uh, that we live in. So should you let your kids watch Disney? Uh, that's, a, that's an answer that requires careful thinking on our part. We can't give it a blanket yes, can't give it a blanket no. We've hopefully laid out here a plan for every parent to really engage with Disney or any other uh, platform or media company out there that uh, will help us discern truth. Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.